So today we have uh, Raheem Fazel, and Raheem is the um, CEO and co-founder of SV Academy. And what's interesting about SV Academy is that every time I turn on my computer, um, I, I see these these av these ad these advertisements for SV Academy, and it sounds like some great stories that's happening. So I knew yeah. I needed to have an opportunity to speak with Raheem about. Uh, not only uh, SV Academy, but really his own story on this being his, I, I believe his his third or maybe fourth venture in the tech. So he, we, there's a lot of information that we can learn from Raheem. So Raheem, welcome to Adventure. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm I'm really excited about this topic. Absolutely. So once again, we we hear so much about SV Academy. You guys do a great job making sure that it gets to the eyes and ears of the people who can really benefit from that. So yeah. just a little bit, how did you decide to start um, SV Academy? Where, where did this come from? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is uh, really inspired by my own personal journey. So I grew up in government housing, my child of immigrants. I don't have a four-year college degree. I was hired and fired from McDonald's while I was, uh, you know, working in high school. I needed that money to, you know, contribute to my family and, um, you know, working at school during the day and then going uh, to do odds and ends, whatever I could, I could do to make uh, some money to help the family, and and I eventually got, you know, inspired by what I was seeing in the tech industry, and I saw, you know, young people uh, doing just amazing things and charting their own course, and even though that wasn't my life or it wasn't happening in my community, I could see it happening out there in the media and uh, videos and, you know, stories and just got really excited about, hmm, I wonder if there's a way I could break into it myself. So I, I taught myself how to sell software, how to build web pages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my best friend and I started a company that eventually, uh, you know, we, we eventually we sold it before graduating high school and, and wow. really that led to um, sort of me just, continuing down this non-traditional path. Um, and once I had, I had broken into the industry and I'd had a taste for what it's like on the other side of it and the opportunity and, and the types of people and growth opportunities and so on, um, it became really important for me to try and find ways of helping other people, you know, people coming from similar circumstances as myself, the types of people that you don't see in the industry typically, um, especially in leadership positions. Um, start to get access uh, to those jobs and career paths and companies and networks. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to, we don't see a lot of people who are, we don't see a lot of diverse people in, in, in positions of, of power, um, CEOs, um, you know, on, on Wall Street, as an example, as many as we, as we ought to. Um, but, you know, all of those folks, you know, um, who are there today, and thankfully there is more representation than we've seen in the past, they've all had to start somewhere and they've needed somebody to believe in them. And the SV Academy story was trying to provide that to people who, you know, really wanted it, were willing to work for it and supporting them from, the, you know, the entry level um, in career opportunities that could uh, lead them uh, to, you know, those, those positions and thereby really changing the workforce um, and, and, and from, from the bottoms up. If you can, just kind of land us from, you know, your experience with selling to, I believe it was Oracle, mm -hmm. and from there, how you moved into SV Academy, and then we can kind of talk yeah, transition about to that. Absolutely. Yeah. SV Academy. Yeah. So... <clears throat> I ended up at Oracle for three years after the sale of uh, one of my companies. And while I was there, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I had the sense that it was going to be bigger than building a software company to sell back to Oracle. It was, there was something more, there was more of an emotional, personal connection I was sure. looking for. Um, and I wanted to create direct impact mm -hmm. uh and the, and what i what i started to see while i was at oracle was that most of us think that engineers uh are the best paid 
mm-hmm. uh, talent at companies, but at Oracle, it actually is the salespeople. Sure. And it's not just Oracle. It's a lot of companies. I say every company, yep. people who drive the revenue, people who support customers are the ones who are closest uh, to uh, you know the strategic goals of yep. the of the board and the CEO and the, and so the uh, the short answer is that inspired me for where uh, that there was much more opportunity and and, and room for people uh, who didn't know how to code but we were over all all of the but all of the training programs out there were really over indexing on coding no one was really mm-hmm. doing anything to support people to work with customers and generate revenue. And that was my path from selling the ice cream and working at McDonald's, you know, self and then self teaching sales and then going into the path that I did and thought, wonder if there's a way to create uh, some kind of structure around um, supporting people with both the skill development as well as the employment. Mm -hmm. And out of that came SV Academy. Wow. So how how did you, I mean, that, that's that's unbelievable that this idea, because I mean, because you were thinking about impact and, and you actually nailed it, because I think some of the challenges that and the conversations that we're having today and and, and your background is such a testimony of that. And, and, and I believe that's probably where you were going to go when speaking about your business school experience. Yeah, that is this ideal around how we think of our own credibility with degrees Mm -hmm. Uh, versus non-degrees and what we could do and what opportunities are available to us. And now there Mm -hmm. seems to be um, kind of a a new wave of conversations and also pathways that are being developed that's more based on competencies and not necessarily on the signal of a particular Mm -hmm. type of degree that we've, we've waved around. So how did you begin to kind of take that idea and and form it into uh, a company and really start looking at who your customer base would be for this. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the benefits of living in Silicon Valley is that I have uh, just at that point, I think I'd lived here for 10 years, something, yeah. some of those lines. Um, and so I knew, you know, I, I knew a lot of people, my friends were people who, who were entrepreneurs like myself and, um, uh, and people I had hired here uh, as junior salespeople had over those years moved into senior positions. And so I was able to tap that community of, of people I knew and talk to them about what they're ex- talking about my idea and talk to them about their experiences with some of the themes that are, are, are you know, really critical to driving the economic argument mm-hmm. for this type of systems change. And they were things like, you know, where are you, you know, what are your, what are your career goals? What are your specific goals for not just your career, but let's get really clear, like for this next year, what do you need to achieve in your career to look like a hero in your organization to your boss? Got it. What are some of the impediments to that? And, you know, I just sort of would continue down that line of thought and it continued, it, it always came back to this idea that talent and, and, and skilled talent uh, was the biggest barrier to uh, my friends in leadership growing their businesses, you know, or growing their teams, mm-hmm. and it was just a, a it was this constant. It was, a, it was a it was a consistent theme that kept coming up in every single conversation uh, we had, and mm-hmm. and you know even up to today, where when you look around the table you know risk addressing you you think about like risk mitigation at a corporate level uh, one of the top five risks that boards are trying to mitigate is is talent risk yeah yeah absolutely right and and if they if they don't have access to the talent um, that they need at the time they need it with the skills that they need it then then the, the company can't grow and can't flourish and can't achieve its 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 higher purpose. And so, um, so you know, I, I got you know, I really attached to that and thought, okay, there's there's a bigger there's there's a real meaty problem to solve here, and and I could actually solve this problem to drive economic, uh, you know, goals while not compromising 
the impact I want to create, the social impact I want to create, and vice versa, because I think that we can solve this talent problem by by you know like bringing um, let's call it new inventory Absolutely. into the market, right? In a in a in a safe and curated, structured way, and do for the the talent industry the same thing that Airbnb has done to the traditional, you know, uh, um, hospitality yeah. industry. And, right? You know, and it's so it's so interesting because you know I I did like a. Um, a line looking at the evolution of talent and how we've looked yeah. at talent. And I, and I won't go over everything here, but, you know, so often, you know, you take, for example, the, the McKinsey model of talent, right? And so that yeah. became kind of the top 10 talent. And so that created a war on talent. Mm -hmm. And really what it essentially did is stopped us from thinking about all the untapped talent that was around because it just became a war for the top 10. Yeah. I think what we're learning now, especially with technology and just an opportunity for talent to be seen um, and to to be connected to opportunities like yours, mm -hmm. that uh, that there's a tremendous amount of talent and skillful people out there given uh, the opportunity. So my my question to you is, um, how were you able to convince? Uh, some of these companies, and I saw your list of companies that your uh, students are going into, that this mind, this old mindset of t a top 10 talent, um, to how, how to move away from that and look at individuals who uh, who should be given opportunity because they're more than capable. Of yeah. Well, I think there's a great entrepreneurial lesson here, which is we've heard this idea, you know, sell don't don't sell a vitamin sell a painkiller yeah. right and accessing talent is such a was and continues to be such a, a, a huge problem for these companies that it didn't take a lot it didn't take as much convincing as mm -hmm. you might think now, yes, it did on, you know, it, 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 at some levels, it absolutely did. For example, mm -hmm. you know, companies did not want to interview, even interview people who did not have a four-year college degree mm -hmm. for most of the life of SV Academy. And, and I think things have begun to evolve, right? And you see Google doing this now and kind of carrying um, the flag and, and other companies, you know, following suit. But I'd say uh, it kind of in a counterintuitive way, it didn't require that much effort because the problem was so it was just so like acute mm -hmm. that that our buyers were saying just get, i need something and, yeah. and you know like yeah sure let's do a pilot let's dip our toes in the water and let's make sure that it works uh, before we turn the volume up but my problem is so significant i i i need you know it's like a bleeding neck you know it's a bleeding neck wound right i, I need yeah. like i'm gonna look at anything and it's um, interesting now because you have so many people out there who are making testimonies on this model. Okay. Like they're saying mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it works and it's real. Because I think that's the other part that th there's one threshold that's with the companies. And then the other threshold is with the potential learners who need to believe that this is something real in mm -hmm. a world in which, you know, there's a lot of things that are sold. And, and I think that level of credibility is also played into it. So I, I think it's very promising. So real quickly, if you don't mind, yeah. just uh, sharing with me. So how does it all work? Share with me some of the features of mm -hmm. SV Academy. How does it work? Well, so we have, um, in some ways, it's, it's, it's really straightforward. So we have, we work with large companies who have, um, you know, large volume hiring needs uh year round and these could be fortune 500 companies uh it, they, they could be um you know uh pre-ipo but fast growing um private companies uh traditionally has been in the tech industry but you know over the last year year and a half has evolved into you know healthcare and financial services yeah. consumer products and we um we 
um, run, uh, you know, these cohorts of um, of training programs um, for them uh, for new hire intake. And so if you think about traditional corporate training, it's typically you're investing in people, uh, you know, after they sure. have received an offer. And in particular, you know, once they become more senior in the organization, right? Sure. The junior people don't typically receive much, you know, training investment. And, and this whole idea of training people even before they get to uh, get to you uh, isn't an area that employers have traditionally, um, you know, uh, seen a, a need for or seen a role for them to, mm -hmm. to, to play. But in a world where talent is so tight um, and companies are unable to, to access uh, the talent that they need because the, the narrow talent that's out there is in high demand and, um, you know, have multiple options. Mm -hmm. um, where there isn't enough skilled labor, we partner with these companies to go and find, you know, the raw talent yeah. that has the the will and the skill, train them. Um, you and know, it's a twelve week program, weeks. correct? It's a twelve week program, and we have, uh, you know, we uh, run different um, types of programs for for different types of uh, you know companies and use cases. But it's essentially it's not like a weekend. Or you know, a couple of nights over a weekend. I mean, this sure. is rigorous, several hundred hours of of very structured training um, in in both the 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 fundamentals of the role uh, mm -hmm. that these that this talent is uh, you know getting prepared for, uh, as well as some of the um, the the specifics around the industry and even the company mm -hmm. uh, that they you know are are. Um, are going to and and what that's allowing us to do is provide this constant stream of talent for companies uh, all throughout the year um, and and these companies then use this talent not only to fill their entry level positions but over time it serves as the bench sure. for for more senior hiring that can now happen internally now the interesting thing to connect with the mission is that we're not the people who are interested in early career training aren't people who have been in the industry before typically. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the folks that we are um, attracting on the talent side are, are people who come from uh, non-traditional backgrounds, yeah. uh, come from non, you know, communities that you don't typically see. Sure. And, and um, you know, and, and there's these companies, the companies who are hiring them on the other side aren't necessarily only looking at, did they complete a degree or did you have this type of work experience or, you know, what's your name and, you know, what, what golf club, you know, where your parents are part of They're they're looking at, um, you know, I mean, honestly, they still probably do look at some of these things or they tell me you're not, but they're also sure. getting a much broader um, and deeper set of signal that's more job aligned sure. uh, as a result of the training that these um, right. individuals. Do. So during the training, are, are they, res what, what's, what's the, the curriculum like in terms of um, delivery? Is it um, a combination of like lot? Cause it's all online, correct? It is. So, yeah. there's, so there's live engagement and it's, and so what, 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 how exactly, or what exactly are they receiving as content? Delivery, yeah. excuse me, delivery. Yeah, well, well, first of all, it's all, it is very, uh, it, it's it's job and career specific and aligned. Yep. So it works backwards from what the employers need uh -huh. and what we feel we need to prepare our graduates for in order to not just do the first job, but to get promoted once they, sure. once they start. Um, which means that we are, uh, not just we, we are very outcomes based in in our in, in our design principles, but we're also giving our graduates a view of the full customer life cycle. Mm -hmm. So how you know not just how sales works, but also how all the supporting uh, organizations and really how the company works as a revenue generating machine. Um, so they understand product and marketing and so on. Uh, and then there are three parts very specifically. There is the kind of technical fundament, like the the fundamental skills of of, of of different revenue generating career paths, like for example, sales or customer success. Mm -hmm. uh, there is professional, social, emotional leadership skill development. I love it, uh, yeah. And then there is 
uh, practical live simulation where you are working, you know, in the rhythms of the business, you are working, you know, with live leads, with the workflow, with the tech stack, um, in a way that um, you're, you're, you're actually able to get good at what you need to do before you start, uh, which builds your confidence up as, as a graduate um, and a future, uh, you know, future employee in these organizations, but also for these companies, um, reduces the ramp time uh, of their hires. Yeah, that's great. It's, well, it sounds like that, um, well, first of all, just the idea that you now have enough graduates that they're making themselves through the uh, the ranks of of different companies uh, says a lot that you are truly kind of a a pipeline uh, mm -hmm. into this into these each, these particular sectors. Uh, a couple more questions. So, um, what is the vision for for SV Academy? And you you've achieved success, and everyone loves what you guys are doing, and you've kind of passed that threshold of credibility. You are there. So what's next? What's what's the next kind of leap? Uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. There are there are two big there are two big problems in the world I'm trying to solve. Mm -hmm. One is a problem in higher education, mm -hmm. which is as, as you heard about my you know of, of my own story, or if you look my own story up, you'll find that um, you know our higher ed institutions uh, have a long way to go to support you know our future generations. And I'm not, it, it's not clear to me, or actually maybe it is clear to me that a four-year traditional degree is not the answer uh, now or in the future. And we need to provide uh, more flexible um, and outcomes-oriented career pathing for, for our people. Mm -hmm. And the second piece is I really want to change the, you know, the, the genetic fiber, the, the DNA of the workforce. And and there's been a lot of conversation about that in the last three years and in, during George Floyd here in, in, in the US and elsewhere, this was a big, you know, a big topic of conversation and, and there's a lot of energy around this, um, but it's not, a, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's a long, it's a long battle. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a long, it's a long journey um, to achieve these ideals that we have. And I think it's not gonna happen by hiring senior people um, because we haven't done the job of building building those pipelines Absolutely. over the generations. No, I'm I mean, I'm of I'm bringing people entry level, right, yeah, and supporting absolutely. them into the future. No, I'm right now. I mean, I, and you and I talked a little bit about this. That you know, one of the reasons why I moved away from uh, higher ed, at least on the what I like to call the gatekeeping side, is because I really felt there needed to be parallel structures created, kind of like what. Um, what uh, what Buck Minister Fuller said years ago mm -hmm. about how you need to just create um, um, uh, different structures in order to disrupt systems that are obsolete. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think that higher ed still can be relevant, but it just needs to look different. It needs to have yeah. a different orientation. And so, what I'm hearing is is that you want to kind of take that on. So, does that potentially mean becoming uh, um, a physical space as well as as well as an online space in the future, or is this how you're just kind of thinking about how the online space can be even more dynamic in how they mm. deliver um, uh, a community and an ecosystem of learners? I I think that the work we're doing here at SV Academy, the the job specific training um starting at the the very entry level needs to exist uh, within the industry ecosystems mm -hmm. within the you know virtual and physical um spaces of our you know most influential um uh, employers and and i think it's not a new concept if you you know if you think about the 70s and early 80s, you know, and through the 80s, IBM, for example, which was, you know, one of the most respected and still is, um, you know, corporations out there invested significantly in um, these sort of corporate university programs to train people coming out of school, right, into, for example, sales and other parts. And there were rotations and, and, um, and, there was structure around it and, and it would be a two or three year 
um, tour of duty that yep. you would do. Uh, you know, it, we have lost a lot of that. Um, you know, in you know within our institutions, sure. uh, higher ed and and corporate, and I think there's a reimagination necessary, and then there's reimagination happening right now, like Absolutely. in this moment in time, uh, to to think about what the future needs to look like, and I think the employers um, uh, are you know banging their fist on the table, saying that it's we we need to have a seat at the table again, and higher. Absolutely. And I think that for employers or for companies, one of the things I often say is that because um, they talk a lot about the skills gap and they're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. However, they have to have some skin in the game, too, because one of the things that I see is that there's there's a rhetoric there. But what is the investment in getting into some of these untapped communities where you can absolutely minds, you know, so absolutely. So absolutely. So one last thing before I go, before you yeah. go, and I know that's your time. So thank you very much for yeah. your time. Yeah. Um, so you're a big sales guy. You love sales. And Daniel Pink wrote a book yeah. about to sell as human yeah. a while ago. And so he really, yeah. really tried to talk about how sales is, you can't escape it. It's just kind of part of mm -hmm. what we do consciously yeah. or subconsciously. Yeah. So from your end, as someone who has definitely benefited from um embracing sales what are some of those key qualities or uh, say key skill sets would you articulate as part of a good sales mindset mm. i'll give you two quick answers to this and i'm going to zoom out because i think this is okay. important in any type of human-centered work that we do right sure. um, number one is to take 100 percent responsibility for the outcome, for your outcome. And, and I, you know, an example of this is if, a, if, if there is, if you are in sales and you're, you, you've been working on a deal and it doesn't close and the buyer walks away, you know, what I, I want like us to, the, the, the way I, I like my people to, to show up in, in those roles is to ask themselves, well, what's my response? Like, this is not what I wanted. Uh, but what is my responsibility in 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 this outcome? How did I co-create this outcome? And um, not taking any more or any less than one hundred percent responsibility, but starting with self. Mm -hmm. And and then I think the second thing is to stay curious. And here I mean staying detached from wanting to be right all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know again in in, in the same way. There's lots of stories that you can come up with when you have a failure, for example, you know, a deal again that you're working on that doesn't get get done, and and those stories uh, can, um, you know, there's bias that we have, and those bias can create sort of blocks for us because we keep looking at the outside world and saying, uh, no, you know, this wasn't. I knew I shouldn't have gone with this person. I shouldn't. They weren't a great customer to begin with, or I don't like working at this company, or I don't like selling this product. Um, but it, it, but if you kind of stay curious and you ask yourself questions, it may help you realize that um, not only it helps you sort of take, stay grounded in the responsibility of co-creating your experience, but it also may unlock for you uh, different perspectives um, uh, and different truths that that might help you um, see a bigger, you know, the bigger picture, uh, and give you a different, and allow you to choose a different truth. Uh, than the one that you have and uh, do a better job next time. Great. Well, Raheem, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming on here. This has been a wonderful conversation. I personally look forward to continuing it offline uh, at some point, uh, because I think there's a lot, a uh, lot in common.